Hey everyone, welcome to the Adrian Tan Show. This is my podcast where I have deep conversations with the people who are enabling organizations to become ready for the future of work. My guests include the mindfulness coach, the folks behind Singapore's most popular investment app, and many more. They all have one thing in common, and that is to help level up your organizations through your people. My guest today is the Executive Director at the Singapore Human Resources Institute, or SHRI, and an accomplished international senior business manager with over 15 years of experience in the financial and consulting industry, where he played key roles in various business and human capital transformation projects that have translated to net bottom line growth of USD $100 million. SHRI is a leading not-for-profit professional HR body which represents a strong network of members comprising individuals and organizations across diverse industries. The group comprising of SHRI Academy, SHRI Corporate Learning and Consultancy Hub and the Singapore Professionals and Executive Cooperative Prospect offers a wide range of services to promote continuous learning, skills upgrading and professional development. The Institute has stayed committed to preparing current and successive generations of people to compete and thrive in a globalised future, thereby supporting Singapore's growth into a world-class nation. Please welcome my guest, Mr. Elvin Go. Elvin, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Hey, thanks Adrian. So tell us more about SHRI and what problem is it trying to solve? Now, SHRI was formed back in 1965, so we are as old as Singapore itself. So SHRI has been um, formed to actually look into a platform for HR professionals back in the past, whereby we did a lot of education in the area of academics and as well as uh, HR advisory work. So in today's context itself, here in 2020 itself, I believe SHRI would have a new agenda. The vision still stay the same, but the mode of operations and execution is very different given the transformation and as well as the accelerated runway that the technology has actually come up, especially over the last eight months of COVID-19. So SHRI exists you know, uh, and hope to exist in the next longer term runway that we will hope to be able to resolve helping organizations to look into transformation of their HR functions to be a true blue HR business partner on that front. So basically supporting HR people in doing a better job where they are. So before I jump into a, a, another uh, interesting question, but I just want to understand for yourself, what motivated you to be involved with or what motivated you to join SHRI and what were you doing before? Well, before SHRI, I was actually in the banking and finance industry for many years. And of course, prior to that, I was in a American global HR advisory consulting house again for many years. So all along, you know, even graduating from university itself, I've always been very curious about the people element or what makes someone tick. Coming from a psychological uh, perspective itself, you know, I wanted to understand uh, what made me who I am, all right? And that's when I got involved in matters like leadership, matters like uh, motivation and so forth. And based on my early conversations with a uh, mentor that I, I have to this very day, he was the one who actually advised me to explore uh, HR as a professional career itself. And that's how I got started in the work in the, in the area of HR. So what got me really excited about SHRI is that when I was first by the SHRI council members itself, you know, and, and recalling that day back in uh, sometime in November and December of 2019, I actually told the council members that I'm not a fan of SHRI, given that uh, what SHRI has been over the last um, 10 years or so, and when I was finally selected for this position itself, it was a great honor and humbling experience for me. Going forward itself, you know, being a non-fan of SHI, I'm trying to rebuild and get SHI to refocus on really becoming a, a true HR business partner and as well supporting the HR community here, working alongside uh, the likes of uh, IHRP, MOM and any other like-minded agencies to have the collective good 
for the industry itself. You mentioned about not being a fan of SHRI during your interview process. I, I'd like to understand more on that. What actually made you come to that sentiment at that point in time? Well, at that point in time, I still remember, you know, I really wanted to do a uh, postgraduate diploma in HR itself. And I remember calling SHRI to inquire about the courses that it was on offer at that point in time. And after several emails, nobody called me, uh, nobody replied on my emails and everything. And I felt that SHRI was not very customer centric. And thus, you know, I decided then to go to another school to pursue my further studies, my postgraduate studies in the area of leadership and management itself. So, you know, and, and, and on that note itself, that got me, you know, uh, that basically left somewhat of a uh, sour taste, you know, being uh, so-called left out uh, from uh, the education perspective when I first connected with SHI. I see. Okay, that's interesting to note. So I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to jump straight into another aspect which you mentioned earlier on, collaboration with IHRP. In, actually, many people that I've spoken with are still trying to resolve what is the difference between SHRI and IHRP. And of course, in Singapore right now, we also have HCLI and a few others. Uh, could you help us to understand the audience to understand what are the key difference and under what situation would you go to SHRI uh, and vice versa. Well, I would like to think that SHRI and IHRP, we are part of the ecosystem. And being part of the ecosystem, there is a need to actually work together. And how IHRP has been formed, it's of course clearly funded by the government agencies to actually look into the accreditation and certification of HR professionals here in Singapore, which I strongly believe is a, something that we really need to do to upskill and reskill some of the, the, the HR community and professionals here. So SHRI exists, as I said, to promote from an advocacy standpoint and also from a competency standpoint to upskill the people. So we run um, various HR courses, all right, which IHRP does not. We put up content, shared content sometimes together with IHRP. Uh, we collaborate with IHRP on webinars from an advocacy standpoint to promote certain views and also to perhaps maybe debate on certain views as well. So there is a clear distinct difference, but yet, you know, being part of the ecosystem. You, I'd like to jump into the history of SHRI. It has been around since 1965, which is a long, long time. And of course, the organization has evolved since then. Could you help us, especially people like myself who are not so familiar in the of the entire history of SHRI, to understand more about how it was, how it became, and how it is it is right now? Well, SHRI has a long history, as I said, since 1965 itself. So we were first formed by members, all right, professionals from the HR community to actually come together to share notes, to share uh, insights, and also de to develop uh, the HR pro professions back then. Of course, back then it was known as personnel management and slowly the evolution of the HR function itself also aided in how the members came together. And over the years, if you, you recall, we used to have uh, a members directory so that anyone could connect with anyone in the HR field. We also had uh, research and a research arm, well, very well research arm to actually put out a lot of thought leadership out there back in the uh, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s as well. So this was basically the history in terms of SHI, of uh, what we actually we have been doing. So over the years, we also have created two different entities. One, of course, is the SHI Academy that is very well known here in Singapore for all the academic programs ranging from foundation certificates right up to master's level. And the other entity that we also created was the SHI Corp. SHI Corp also exists to provide uh, basic legislation advisory work and as well as certain types of advisory or consulting as what we want to call it in the area like performance management systems, job redesign and so forth, which actually ties back in to the SHI Academy overall academic offerings as well. So we use what was interesting as well that many people might not know, you know, SHI 
being a members company, a uh, members organization, so we used to have a jackpot room. So that was something very interesting. Jack, jackpot room? Yes. Okay. So, so that's something very interesting. All right. Of course, we, we decided to refocus. All right. I think regardless of, of uh, what had happened itself, we decided to really refocus on the need food. All right. And, and I think we have actually then took a major decision to actually exit that so-called lucrative business that we were once uh, uh, helped uh, back in, I think this is more, I think more than 10 over years ago. Wow. So the next important question, would there be plans to bring back the jackpot room? Definitely not, Adrian. You know, uh, although, you know, some people view and some members even say, oh, when are we bringing back? I think we would really like, like to focus on the needful, which is, you know, helping the HR professions to actually upgrade and reskill themselves and for the collective good itself. So the focus definitely is to become uh, a real HR body here in Singapore and also in the region itself. SHRI is also a member of the Asia Pacific Federation of Human Resource Man uh, Professionals as well. So there is a very clear, strong mandate that we do not only exist here in Singapore, but we also have a ecosystem to play around the region as well. So we collaborate with the likes of the HR community in Australia, in China, Hong Kong, um, and different parts of Asia Pacific. So there is a lot of work that we are coming together to put up. I see. That would be a shame. Otherwise, you'll see me more hanging around SHRI <laughs> to come back. So I, I'd like to go into what was actually raised up in the newspaper probably a few months ago um, when a study was, or straw poll was done by the Sunday Times to identify the top five essential as well as the top five non-essential workers. And HR happened to fall under one of the top five non-essential workers, which, of course, together with all the other professions that happened to be on the list, raised a lot of hoo-ha within the community. And given that SHR has been around since 1965, I, I'm sure there has been a lot of improvement going on. But why do you think that impression, that sentiment still prevails, that HR is one of the non-essential category? among the people that actually responded to the poll? Well, Adrian, the straw poll itself, you know, of course, we do not know the methodology that was used behind that poll. Clearly, you know, I, I do not fully agree that HR is one of the least essential services needed here. In fact, if you look at what has been done, even prior to before Circuit Breaker itself, the HR community has come together, really helped one another to put out information to help um, interpret the various policies that were fast and fury that were coming out from our government in terms of saving jobs, in terms of asking employers to actually look into the mental health of our employees and workforce and, and so forth. So so on that on that poll itself, I, I fully do not agree that HR is one of the non-decession services. And I think the perception out there is that among the, the workforce itself, they always view that HR itself is a very administrative department, which I do not really blame them. You know, and I think this is also a good opportunity for the HR community to say, hey, look, you know, perhaps uh, there's some truth to it. And as I said, opportunity for us to really look at how we can step up, how we can improve further how we can really become a strategic HR business partner on that front, you know, and really work with uh, the leaders of the organization, the business leaders of the, of the organization, and as well as our employees to put out more robust, more holistic plans, and as well as initiatives uh, to improve productivity for our businesses, but also to look into uh, greater need of welfare of our workforce as well. So what I'm hearing is HR is definitely on the right track operationally, doing a lot of right things. However, they probably are not beating the drum lah, to let people know about the right things that they are doing. Exactly. So that perhaps is something uh, for the HR professional listening. Uh, you may want to think about and don't be afraid to raise your hand and claim credit when the credit rightfully belongs to you. Yep. I'd like to move on to the next part, which is something that uh, MOM actually mentioned during the event by HRM Asia. Uh, a lot was said about some of the HR initiatives, a lot of things that will be happening. I'm sure you have some ideas and some opinions on that. What was your take on those announcements that were made? 
Well, if you are referring to the recent announcements of fair consideration framework, Yes, that's one of them. Okay, so let me talk a little bit on the fair consideration framework. On the 21st of October, we are going to have a webinar on the fair consideration framework. And honestly, you know, of course, the, the community or even, you know, the workforce here is split uh, between Singaporeans building uh, or the need of organizations to build a Singapore core versus the foreign talent. You know, I, I for one, honestly, both as a HR professional and as well as a, perhaps a Singapore citizen myself, hold the view that Singapore's economy is an open economy. And therefore, definitely there is a need to actually look into the merits of, of why we should actually go towards hiring uh, foreign talent here in Singapore. You know, and I, I come up with these three words. You know, we need, as a country, there's a need to supplement our workforce. There's a need also to complement our workforce. And there's a need to also enhance our workforce. So on that front, is if you look at it from a supplementary standpoint, there are certain roles that, or rather there are certain jobs, roles, technical knowledge that are scarce here in Singapore. And that's where the supplementary um, talent needs to come in. In terms of complementary itself, you know, diversity helps. Diversity has been proven over and over again that uh, when complementary products or, or skill sets are, are coming together itself, organizations have a win-win outcome. In terms of enhancement itself, let's face it, there are certain roles, certain skill sets that the Singapore core might not have, right? Especially, for example, in the area of deep tech, uh, be it AI, ML, and so forth that we are all hearing about. And it's so exciting to hear about all this, right? And that's where I think certain skill sets that the foreign talent bring can actually enhance the knowledge economy that Singapore has been uh, known for over all these years. So that's one of the angles that I truly hold, hold firm in itself. Right. And I, right now, given that we are in the pandemic, obviously it has become uh, very challenging for businesses as well as HR practitioner. Given your constant dialogue with the HR people out there, what are some of the key challenges that they are facing and how is SHI trying to address them? I think some of the tactical challenges that a lot of the HR professionals are coming up with is that their workforce itself, clearly number one is the mental wealth, the mental, the mental health of the workforce itself. Although the government has uh, allowed the organizations, the business community to, to return back, you know, not more than 50% of the workforce back to the organization, the default is still that we still need to work from home. So since 7 or April to now, the to be honest, I think the mental health has has, has taken a hit on it, but I think uh, that's something that the HR community needs to pay close attention to. That's number one. Number two is, of course, you know, as we reach the tail end of the financial year for most, the greatest challenge that a lot of uh, HR professionals are also facing is how do I evaluate performance for this year itself, right? And that's also been a issue that has come up over and over again through the various inquiries that uh, has come through SHRI. So, you know, and I said to many of these inquiries that honestly, if you are trying to evaluate your sales guys, for example, who, who has not met the targets, you know, I think that's where the compassion of the organization needs to come out better, the leadership perspective. And looked at it that this year itself is a, a, block, a black swan year. And, and perhaps we may take and look at different skills or measurement for performance and not stick to the hard targets that were designed back in 2019 or early 2020 before COVID-19 hit us. Got you on that. And I, I'd like to just jump straight into what has been the interesting cases that SHRI have seen recently when it uh, is speaking with all the different companies out there. Some of the key challenges that they would be looking into out, more of outside of COVID, what are the what are the things that is keeping them awake at night uh, beside COVID-19? I think some of the challenges that is keeping the HR professionals and business leaders awake is that 
when can some form of normalcy return, right? Because clearly organizations who could and can doing this phase itself, everybody's wondering, would work from home, would, you know, acceleration of technology or embracing it in terms of technology, HR technology in particular, be the way to go and how to go about it. Because honestly, if you think about it, there's so much content and literature out there about future of work, upskilling, reskilling, using technology, using data, using digital transformation and, and everything. But what is really, really missing is the ingredients to go and embark on this journey itself. You know, we have been talking about so high level, all right, for, and those who can and could, we fully understand them. But what about those who don't understand? What about the traditional brick and mortar organizations in the SME space, for example, all right, who are still here in Singapore? Um, I don't think they have the necessary technical knowledge to actually incorporate uh, various technology, you know, don't even talk about the uh, HR technology, all right? They don't, they don't really know how to go about doing it. Where do I go for step one? What is the ABCs of it? How do I go about it? Don't keep telling me about future of work. Don't tell, don't keep telling me about reskilling, upskilling. Don't tell me about, you know, technology, embracing digital transformation and so forth. A lot of the organizations. Yeah, at least those that have actually come through our inquiry systems or those that I've actually spoken to, they say, please give us the specific details of how to go about or how to go about starting off. I see. So they basically do not know what is even step one, let alone step 10, step 20. Correct. Exactly. So take for example, right, we talk about looking at data, right, using data itself as a means to make business decisions. All right, and there was recently a, a advisory project that I was called in to actually assist. And when they tried to look at the number of uh, control points in this organization itself, their processes and procedures were still something that they were so accustomed to like 10 years ago. You know, like the HR manager was also the admin and finance manager, and she was under a, 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 a mountain of information, but her processes were so outdated, right? And imagine if you have all these outdated processes being pumped into a platform for, for, for where the outcome is to look at some form of transformation itself. So again, it's like rubbish in, rubbish out, right? So clean up processes, clean up your procedures, strengthen your governance controls and everything. All right. I think that's really step one before actually embarking on, you know, or going out to engage a, a, an organization or external vendor to start looking at digital transformation. If you do, and I think that's, 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 in, that's very important in terms of you know, getting off on a good start itself because you don't want to be measuring, uh, capturing data itself whereby even you don't even have a good workflow itself, for example. So modernizing the process of your organization is one of the key challenges that many HR in SME face. And this is something that you definitely can reach out to SHRI to get some support on. And maybe just for the benefit of everyone, uh, could you just help list down the kind of solutions or services that SHRI can provide to the HR community? Well, SHRI, as I said, works with uh, various vendors. We, uh, we would like to be known as the Network of Networks. Itself. So some of the other services, as I said, other than the uh, training and development in the L&D space that we offer, right, from foundation certificates right up to uh, the master's program, we do also have various short courses that talks about uh, or train people, you know, in area of digital transformation, HR and leadership and so forth. Uh, SHI Corp handles most of the advisory work itself, uh, be it simply just to put together uh, your handbook to make sure that it's in accordance with the local employment act and fair consideration practices and so forth we too can actually uh, go into other areas of uh, assessments and diagnostics as well so these are the capabilities that we have quickly built and i said earlier on to refocus shri all right on the needful itself to actually 
help the HR community to actually move forward. So again, you know, we are a network of networks and we do partner with the best in class. And you know, over the last couple of months, I would really like to support the, the local boys here, the, the, the local vendors who have been so supportive of SHRI and also myself, given uh, that I'm very new to, to the organization itself. So yeah. SH- so what's next for SHRI over the coming quarter as well as 2021? I think this is where, you know, as I said, we, we are looking at the, the need to be the network network. So I'm putting together a group of HR tech guys to come together and to look at the people intelligence area. All right. Currently, if you look at the ecosystem, we have the HRMS guys, we have the talent acquisition platform guys, we have the assessment psychometric guys and so forth. Uh, we also have the payroll and whatnot systems out there, right? So where I'm coming from is that, you know, business intelligence-wise is very rich, it's very deep, and there's many, many players as well. And I and those guys are wonderful. But when I look at the people intelligence portion, the people intelligence portions cannot be just be one aspect of a HR system. It must be a entire ecosystem. And that's where... I started to talk to uh, many, many local founders in the HR tech space. And they said that, and they have given me their verbal support to put together this platform and to curate a one-stop shop service for any organizations who need to really deep dive into their people intelligence area, right? So that then concrete business decisions can be made, right? And also in support of the business strategy. As I've always been advocating, the HR strategy or people strategy cannot divert from the business strategy. It must go in tandem, hand in hand. And that's where the PI, I call it for short for people intelligence, I initiative that I'm, I hope to embark on it here at SHI can actually then provide that level of support and service. Thank you so much for sharing that. And for people who is interested to find out more about SHRI, where can they go to? The website is a good source, all right, www.shri.org.sg. That's a clear first part of call if you really need to contact us, right? Other than that, our hotline 6438-0012. Look forward to seeing you guys uh, on our LinkedIn profile as well, you know. Thank you so much. All this will be in the show notes. And for those of you who may be interested to call in or write in, I'm very certain the customer service support would be much better given that Elvin is helming it right now and he had a bad history with it. So thank you so much for sharing with us the history, the outlook, as well as what's going on with SHRI to help us better understand how it's doing right now and what we can expect to look forward to. And I have a great conversation with you today and I hope you enjoy it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for listening to the podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to more information about our guests and their businesses. If you enjoyed this podcast, it will be helpful to give a review on iTunes or follow me on Spotify. If you're using Overcast, please hit the star button under the episode. That will help get this podcast and the episodes out to more people who may find it useful. I will see you in the next episode of The Adrian Tan Show.